there a perfect width and thickness for sword blades? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here of Scholar Gladiator. Now recently I've been looking at a lot of antique Japanese blades, augmenting my collection, buying some stock, this kind of stuff. And I've been looking at the proportions of Japanese swords. You notice I'm not holding a Japanese sword, I will be in a minute. Um, and I have noticed something interesting. So when we look at uh, Asian swords, um, it could be Indian swords like uh, Talwas, it could be uh, Middle Eastern swords like um, uh, Shamshir, uh, Kilich, things like this, or it could be Chinese Dao. We see quite a lot of blades that are fairly broad. Now, one of the things that's no Notable about Japanese swords. I'll just grab an example. I'll grab this one here. Um, so this is a 17th century Kanban blade um, and you will notice that it's fairly narrow um, in terms of its width in this direction. It's nowhere near as wide for example as a typical Chinese Dao. Okay, now there were blades like this that were adopted in China and they would have been referred to as Dao uh, and Japanese blades certainly had an influence on Chinese blades and so they did end up with some blades that were narrower like this. However, one of the things that's really notable about the early, should we say, Tang Dynasty Dao and then the um, sort of Katana, well actually the Tachi and then the Katana, um, is that they have relatively narrow blades but they do tend to be thick. So if we compare with a broader blade in general, and this is a kind of headline for all swords, when you have a very broad blade, and it could be this is a, um, <laughs> what is this? This is a 15th century sword. This is from the uh, Windless Royal Armourist line, which I worked on. This is the first batch, we're now working on the second batch. And this is a very broad blade, but it's a very thin blade. So in some ways it's quite like a falchion or a langmesser. Um, and a little bit superficially, like a machete, as we said, because a machete is broad, but it's thin. Now, in terms of mass, this has got the same kind of mass as a narrower blade, but it's squished out into a broader format. So it's got a similar amount of steel in it, but squished into a different shape. So this is, generally speaking, thinner, but broader. And something that's interesting uh, and really obvious, actually, when you think about it, is very often blades which are narrower in that direction are thicker in that direction, and they have roughly the same amount of steel in them, therefore. Now, I was looking at Japanese blades and I was looking at uh, width and, um, and I was looking at thickness and I noticed something that I kind of never really thought about before. Um, now I'm going to grab one at random, let's grab one off the wall, here we go. They are actually really similar to European uh, sabres, uh, military swords. Now. Isn't that odd? I never really thought about that before, but I've spent, you know, 20, 30 years uh, collecting these things and the last 10 years uh, buying and selling them. Um, and that's, you know, one of my day jobs is, is dealing in these. And I'd never really thought about it before, but in the world of swords, when we compare everything from medieval swords to Chinese swords to Indian swords to everything, even African swords, whatever, in the grand scheme of things, isn't it fascinating that 19th century military swords ended up having a similar thickness and taper-ish and a similar width to a Japanese sword, despite the fact they went down completely different evolutionary paths? Um, because at the end of the day, in uh, in Europe, you know, we went, it took quite a long time to get to those swords and we went via um, you know, basket hilted swords and rapiers, uh, like that one up there, obviously long swords, arming swords, all this kind of stuff. So we had many, many different types of swords, but we ended up in the 19th century with a military sword which has very similar proportions, okay it's longer, but similar proportions in terms of width and thickness to a Japanese sword. And actually when you place a load of antique Japanese blades next to a load of 19th century European sabres, they are similar size. The Japanese swords tend to be a bit shorter and they tend to have less distal taper. They tend to be thicker towards the point, um, but they've got a similar mass to them, uh, similar width, similar thickness. So is that the optimum <laughs> effectiveness for a sword? What is the advantages and strengths and weaknesses? Well, we, we sort of touched on this topic in the past. Why would a medieval person want a blade that is thinner but broader? Well, one thing we can say is that I think most people go, well, if you have a broader blade that's thinner, it's got increased cutting capacity. 
But does it? <laughs> because let's think about this for a second. European sabres and Japanese swords both cut really, really well. Now, I have the um, honour and pleasure to cut with many different styles of blade. You know, Chinese Dao, Japanese Katana and Tachi, um, sabres, European sabres, arming swords, long swords, falchions, all sorts. Okay, and at the end of the day, what cuts well, cuts well. And it doesn't only follow one format. There isn't only one type of sword. It's not only curved swords, only straight swords, only broad swords, only thick swords. They can all cut well, but they might deal with different targets better or worse. Okay, so isn't that strange that katana uh, and tachi, Japanese blades in other words, would um, refer to wakasashi as well, end up with similar width and thickness ratios to European sabres and back swords. So why did some medieval people, and we've talked about this, what is the purpose of falchions before, why did some medieval swords have broader, thinner blades? I don't know, I don't know. Answers on a, on a postcard or down in the comments below. But one thing I would say, so I've got two other medieval swords here. So I think a lot of people have the perception, they think about falchions or they think about those broad types of arming swords. They think about maybe Viking era swords and they have a perception that medieval swords are broader than 19th century swords. But here's something we've got to set straight. It's not always the case. First of all, I will, I will, refer, you, I will refer you to this piece of uh, evidence, my lord. Um, these types of long swords. So quite simply, these, um, these, these swords are tapering and narrow. And actually, they are much narrower at this portion of the blade than a typical military sabre is of the 19th century. Much, much thinner. And yes, they've got a different purpose. There's, we know the reasons for that. They're a very thick and stiff blade. They're used in half sorting. They're used for stabbing into mail, into armpits, and you know, fighting in armour, all this kind of stuff. So it's a different blade design for a different purpose. But that really just as a fact it is worth noting this is a 14th and 15th century style of blade that is way narrower <laughs> although it is thick is way narrower than swords which came later equally i want to point out the next piece of evidence my lord is the so-called oak shot type 19 type blade as featured on the Rebaldo from lk chem which i worked on with them and this type of blade is actually found continuing to be used on basket hilts even in the 19th well 20th century actually in military models um, but yeah it's still being used right the way through from the beginning of the 15th century you could even say the end of the 14th century all the way through the centuries still being used in the 17th 18th 19th century so this is a model of blade that stuck around and yeah you get some that are narrower some that are longer some that are shorter but fundamentally this type of blade stays around. So there was no major change. So often on this channel, we try to explain things in terms of context, don't we? We talk about fighting in armor or out of armor. We talk about mounted versus foot. We talk about the um, um, uh, complementary weapons of the day where, when people switch from using bucklers to daggers in the left hand, when they went to using pistols in the left hand, all of these sorts of things. But actually, there are certain blade types, and Japanese blades are an example. Japanese blades didn't really change an awful lot in their basic design from about the 10th century right the way through to now. And equally, as we just saw with the Rebaldo blade there, there are certain types of European blade which didn't really change all the way through. And then mixing in with that, we end up with proportions, at least cross-sectional proportions on European sabre blades, which are actually not that different to a Japanese katana tachi wak wakasashi, a Japanese blade, Nihonto. Um, and so really, actually, these kind of blades, uh, which you could compare this European blade with obviously falchions, as I've mentioned, it is basically a falchion functionally, but you could compare it with the Chinese dao, certain types of dao, um, and certain other types of sword you'll find in the world as well. These are actually slightly outliers. They are thinner and broader. Why is that? Um, we could say it's for specialised for fighting lighter targets. We don't really know, but at the end of the day, this is a type of sword that was carried by knights, men-at-arms in the 15th century in a heavily armoured environment, and yet they were still using these. 
So clearly, um, there wasn't only one solution at that time, even though in that environment, say, you know, Wars of the Roses or um, the Swiss Burgundian Wars or whatever, swords like this were being used against um, archers in Brigandines and Salats and not much else, uh, or against armoured knights. Um, so they were being used in a, against a variety of different opponents on horseback, on foot, um, and so they were multi-purpose swords, and yet they are radically different blade designs, which I guess as a headline we could say there is no perfect blade design, just some are better at some things than others are. But isn't that interesting? So this is, I, I imagine for some of you this will be an unsatisfactory video because it doesn't give any great conclusions or assertions or it doesn't make any big argument. I just think there's some interesting reference points there and comparisons that we should think about and question and deep dive into a bit before. And I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion, some of the conclusions I've made in videos in the past are too simplistic or um, I've been, I've received more information, more knowledge, or I've thought more deeply on the topic since then. And I may to, need to go back and revise some of those things. Why did the Talwar why was it so popular in India? Why is that particular style of hilt, that particular range of blades so, uh, so popular and prevalent in India when in Europe, why did we end up with basically militaries all over Europe and beyond America and so on using pretty similar types of sword? Um, why did in Japan, <clears throat> why did they settle on this relatively narrow but relatively thick blade when that was comparatively different to what was being done across the water in China, for example, or over in places like the Philippines, where they have completely, you know, you could say, you could simplistically say, oh, well, they were using certain types of armor in, in Japan, but is that a specialized armored fighting blade? I don't really know that it is. Uh, so anyway, I think so many questions and so many years more of research to come, but interesting comparisons to be made. Your thoughts, as always, will be welcome in the comments down below. Um, had you thought about the comparison of the cross-sectional ratio, width and thickness comparison between a Japanese sword and a European military sword before? I, I don't know that I really had. And why? At a time when narrow tapered thrusting blades were becoming so popular in Europe, why did some people go for these types of blades, falchions and langmesser, and in this case, an arming, a single-edged arming sword, that were so different to that, relatively flexible, relatively thin, but really broad? Uh, and why did the Chinese love the Dao so much? Why did the Chinese end up with the relatively broad bladed and thin bladed Dao when the Japanese ended up with a relatively narrow but thick bladed Katana? I don't know. Um, anyway, I look forward to seeing your comments down below. I hope I see you back on the channel really, really soon. And uh, take care, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.